Hi there and welcome to this video. As many of us come out of lockdown, we'll be thinking about our bucket lists as perhaps we're allowed to travel a bit wider. And you'll know that from my previous two videos, I've been taking a slightly layered approach to this. I've looked at um, local opportunities in and around the UK. I've done the second video on perhaps slightly further afield for me, which is Europe. And this is the final in the three part series, which is looking at sort of worldwide opportunities, which might be a bit longer in coming to fruition. They tend to be a bit more expensive. They tend to require a lot more planning. Um, and it's really important to do that planning to make sure you get the most out of your bucket list, as it may be that you only ever go to these places once or perhaps twice. As with all the other bucket lists, my worldwide bucket list is quite extensive and quite long. Um, and this is just intended to pick out some of the highlights and you know, explain some of my thinking around my bucket list and hopefully give you some inspiration, get you thinking about what's on your bucket list. What are you going to be doing when, you come, when we all come out of this uh, lockdown period and perhaps move a couple of years into the future? What is it that you're looking forward to? What are you looking to plan? So, as I say, my bucket list is quite extensive and what I've tried to do is distill it down in this video to a smaller number of areas or places and I'll give you a bit of an insight as to why they're on my bucket list. So the first one I'm going to cover is the Pacific Northwest of the US and I'll include in that a little bit of um, British Columbia in Canada. Um, I've been to many parts of the US and Canada and I quite like the um, southwest down Phoenix, Arizona because of the arid nature and the um, landscape around there. I also like the deep south particularly because of the cuisine down there. Um, so I've traveled quite extensively but one part I haven't really been to is the Pacific Northwest of the US and in particular Oregon. Um, and I'll add BC on that list because they are quite local and therefore it's likely if I go to one I'll probably spend some time in the other. Um, but for me Oregon is one of those places that um, perhaps sits in the shadow of Seattle and Vancouver and the Rockies. Um, but having done some research and talked to some people it could be one of those understated road trips because you've got the Oregon coast, you've got waterfalls, you've got national parks with mountains and then if you go up the coast you've got the Olympic National Park and then over into Vancouver Island and BC which are equally beautiful. Now weather is always going to be a bit of a challenge in this part of the world and it's not too different from the UK luckily so it's not something I'm, that particularly phases me but it's something you have to think about and um, manage into your expectations. So um, it's really important if you want to get perhaps the sunsets in Oregon I believe either May or September is quite good so after the winter and spring so uh, storms but before the sort of summer fog and mistiness you get there. And you've got to balance that with what's the temperature. So quite a bit of planning to go on because there are windows where it is optimum. Um, that's not to say I wouldn't go outside of season because sometimes you get a totally different experience out of season as I discussed in my Europe video with Venice and going there out of season. So I think it's one of those places that has a lot of opportunity in it and um, it was one of those places that actually was becoming increasingly easy to get to before lockdown with direct flights to Portland um, opening up very soon. So it'll be interesting to see how that fares after we come out of lockdown. But equally you can get to Seattle and Vancouver fairly easily from the UK. Number two on my list is Central and South America. I know it's a big area. Um, I've been there a number of times to different parts of um, South America in particular. Um, and it's vast and therefore I'm going to bring a couple of um, countries stroke areas to the surface that are really higher up on my bucket list than some of the others. The first one is um, in Central America and it's I started off looking at Costa Rica particularly drawn by the nature and the rainforests there but equally as I've been researching Costa Rica I've also um, seen that Belize is quite a, an interesting place to potentially go and may have some opportunities over Costa Rica and be slightly different. So as I say it's about the rainforest, the nature but also the coastal aspects of those two countries that are really um, drawing me towards them. You know Costa Rica is beautiful but it's also quite popular. 
So that's why Belize may fit the bill um, in a different way. Now again, before the um, lockdown period, we were seeing increasing numbers of direct flights to Costa Rica from the UK. Uh, so again, we'll have to see after the um, lockdown period and see how that works. And with Costa Rica and Belize, it may be one of those areas that actually to get the most out of them in a, a relatively short time. It's one of those places where actually having a guide can be really beneficial. And we found this when we were on safari, actually having guides and rangers with you to help you find the right positions, the right locations at the right times of day, to actually see the animals and birds that you want to see, and then to help you explain to you the habitat and the, the um, habits of the birds and animals. It really can outweigh the cost of paying for a tour sometimes, so long as you pick the right tour company and tour guides. The other challenge around Costa Rica and Belize is potentially if, we, you know, if you're looking for nature, then actually having a slightly longer lens might be um, really important. So either hiring one to take with me or buying a, a lens, we might have to factor that into the costs of it also. So as I said, I've been to South America a number of times and been to a few different countries there for different reasons. And I know it's massively diverse, not only in distances, but in the cultures um, and the landscape around there. One of the countries that comes to the top of the list is Argentina. Um, and I think that's a mixture of attractions for me. And it's partly the culture, but also the landscapes. It's a vast country. You perhaps don't get that when you look at it in Google Maps or on a, a globe. Um, obviously, Buenos Aires is the sort of first point of call and spending a bit of time in Buenos Aires, soaking up the culture there, the architecture, the history, um, gives you a bit of a, a street photography opportunity. I think then you've got two opportunities in Argentina when I've been looking at it, and I'm drawn by both of them. You can either go south down to the Argentina-Chile border and the Torre del Paine um, National Park, or you can go north to the high altitude around Salta where you've got the wine um, region, you've got salt flats, you've got mountains with the strata, the coloured strata in, and you've got cactus forests. So you've got very different opportunities. For me at the moment, it's sort of Buenos Aires and the north first. Um, and equally, again, you've got to think about the weather in these kind of places. With a country like Argentina or Chile that go pretty much from the equator down to um, Antarctica, You've got to think about at what time of year are you going to the different parts. You need to go perhaps a different time of year if you're going south to Patagonia compared to if you're going north to Salta. So it kind of brings to the fore the requirement, the, the importance of doing planning and taking your time to get it right. So number three on the list um, is polar bears. And whilst the Galapagos, the Antarctic are on most people's bucket lists, and they're on mine too. The cost can be prohibitive um, for some of these locations. Equally, availability can be a bit of a challenge. However, visiting the polar bears from sort of Churchill in northern Canada has also been on my list, and it's been on my list for many years. And just looking at the opportunity to go out on a safari, perhaps on foot, but also in they have these vehicles which are um, one, two stories high, and you can go out and get really close to the polar bears, um, is a real photo opportunity. And whilst the polar bear is the hero image, there's you know, lots of other wildlife there. And again, you know, other photo opportunities such as the Northern Lights. So for me, you know, perhaps polar bears is a more achievable um, item on my bucket list than the Galapagos or Antarctica at the moment. And that's why it's made it up slightly higher when I've been researching it. That attraction hasn't gone away um, and that's why I put it on this list. The fourth country now, we're moving further east, um, is India. Having been to India many times, I find it immensely interesting because of its diversity. Um, I think in India, the banknotes have 18 different languages on, for example. It is a massive country again, and therefore very diverse culturally and photographically. Um, and therefore, you've got to crop in a little bit into what you want to achieve. Um, I think 
the highest on my list from the locations I've looked at is perhaps the sort of, it's a little bit touristy, but the Delhi and Northern Rajasthan sort of triangle um, where you've got a combination of food and culture. You can perhaps go and visit the tigers in the Ranthambore um, National Park. You've got the desert at Jaisalmer, so you've got lots of different opportunities. And of course, when you're traveling around India, perhaps, you know, traveling on the trains is again a real experience and the cities. So you've got that street photography blend with a little bit of nature, with culture and with great food. So a real experience and one where there are so many photo opportunities, you are never short of um, photos and images to try and capture. So finally on this um, quick canter through my worldwide bucket list, number five is Japan. And I've been here a couple of times already, but it still makes it back onto my bucket list. Um, we've been there in the summer and the fall time, um, but Japan is like the UK, it's very seasonal and therefore to complete the collection I need to go back in winter for the cranes and, and the snow and spring for cherry blossom. Equally going down to Okinawa is on my bucket list because that's very different from the mainland of Japan. Every time we've been to Japan we've learned something new, we've seen something different, it's culturally and historically interesting. And it's very photography friendly and I've done a couple of videos on this and I'll put a link above to, to those. And even after about six weeks in Japan in total, it still has so much to give. Um, we still find that everywhere we go, we see and learn something new. The advantage is having been a couple of times, we know how it works now. And therefore, if there was a cheap air ticket comes up once lockdown, um, we get out of lockdown, then it may just be an opportunity to go and just you know, visit some of those other less known areas. So this is just the tip of the iceberg for my bucket list. I hope it's given you some inspiration, some, th some areas, some places to think about. Maybe you haven't really thought about your bucket list and actually spending a few hours just doing a bit of web research and thinking about where could you go? What would you want to do? What's on your list? It'd be great to hear what's on your bucket list on a worldwide um, nature. It might give me some inspiration. It'd be great to hear it. So drop it in the comments below. As always, I hope you've enjoyed this quick canter through my worldwide bucket list. Please do subscribe and hit the notification bell to be notified of future videos. It does help keep my channel going. And as always, I look forward to seeing you in a future video.